Okay. All right, we are live, and today we got Mr. Alan Wunsch with uh, Token Funder. So, Alan, really excited to have you here today. How are you? I'm great, Sonny. How are you? I am well, my friend. So, great to be um, here with you. yeah, yeah, great. So, um, hmm. So, you and I, we met. It's been some time, hasn't it? We, we. I'm trying to remember when we first crossed paths. It probably had something to do with uh, Bitcoin blockchain meetups, didn't it? It certainly did. It could have been, I, I, I could go back to 2015, but it was definitely in that uh, 2015, early 2016 timeframe. Cool. Think was, so yeah. yeah, I remember that. And you were, you were, a, you were uh, big into kind of helping, you know, foster the community here in Toronto and, and kind of help people get connected. Uh, so I, I have a lot of a admiration for people who, who do that. Um, and so I, I guess before we begin, uh, you know, I usually like to start uh, with kind of the backstory, right? So before Bitcoin, before, you know, Ethereum, before this whole kind of crypto stuff came into your life, uh, I don't know, take it back as far as you want, uh, but would love to know a little bit about your backstory and, uh, and then maybe we'll dovetail into some of the projects. Sure, I'm happy to share some of that. Uh, some of that backstory. I think I came to I came to the blockchain space after having most recently been in the banking sector, which was highly regulated, highly kind of uh, tech driven. I mean, it was getting to be tech driven, and I was working in one of the international banks. Uh, and I, I mean, I can go back um, to an eclectic career that I have, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background. But, uh, you know, I think this is, for me, uh, kind of an interesting uh, time and a, and a great transformation in the financial sector. And I was in one of the international banks in the, in the Toronto market. Of course, uh, Canada is well known for its uh, international banking. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and it's banking prudence, um, and I got to work with the 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 regulators, the the you know those that really kind of manage the overall financial system of the world. And in, in some ways, mm -hmm. frankly, it was mind expanding because my background was fintech. My background was working with CFOs because. And, and this is, you know, part of the eclectic piece of this. Uh, I started off as in, as in university, I started off as a, a business uh, and a chemistry major. So it was kind of science and business together. And I got my business degree, I got my MBA, and I started off in the finance space after that because I couldn't kind of see going on in the kind of lab world in the in the science uh, pure sciences so i ended up doing uh real kind of finance uh transformational work um with my uh finance uh, degree which was uh, or my finance designation which was a cpa uh through and, the, and we're going back what like uh this is now uh, about 10 years or so or uh oh we're, my we're, uh, story. <laughs> 20 years I, okay. I, i'm a little i'm a little bit older than you uh so so let's let's put it this way it was in the 90s so okay. in the 90s just as the really just as the internet was uh becoming something and you know you you may you may also under you know have background in you know dial-up modems and, and such, right? I mean, that was the very early days in the '90s, uh -huh. and uh, so I was working with Pricewaterhouse, and I was working on these you know really interesting financial things. Um, it was always about um, data. It was always about you know how do you most efficiently move data around and and drive uh, kind of business intelligence out of it. Uh, you know, how do you manage uh, finances most effectively? And I got I got to work with some of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, which was great. It wasn't enough of the doing. So this is why it's very eclectic. I grew up in an entrepreneurial household, so had an engineering engineering kind of business uh, that I could have taken over, uh, but I decided to go into the world of uh, finance and that. Now, adding onto that is the fact that uh, as a teenager, I was a coder. So I started into uh, just real kind of programming and uh and was was employed as uh, you know coming into university i was actually employed as a as a coder 
uh, creating programs. So I, I felt most at home when I was connecting the finance and the code, the finance and the latest in technology. So it turned out that yeah, there was a lot of uh, systems um, advancements, SAP, um, Oracle, all these kind of global databases that happened in the 90s, uh, which, which was great. And, and I cut my teeth there. But I was working on very large engagements and I saw the internet. So when the first kind of wave of the internet happened and we saw what was happening with, with Amazon, with eBay, with, with others like that, we knew there was something massive happening. And so I, I left Pricewaterhouse and I had a small startup, which, which basically was, a, uh, it was like a, uh, it was a job posting um, site and it was going to allow for kind of decentralized job posting. And we didn't call it that then. Um, but I also worked with a lot of other startups at the time and, and helped to build one of the earliest uh, incubators in the Toronto space, which ended up being, what we call the uh, Mars Discovery District today. So that kind of evolved into that space. Uh, so, so there you go. It's pretty. It's, it's been pretty eclectic, starting from chemistry, science, uh, into business, into tech, into startups, and I got roped back into one of the, as I said, one of the largest uh, Canadian international banks here uh, to take on a massive data uh, systems assignment. So. I, I did that for a number of years, but there was nothing happening um, in the out, out, outside of the spaghetti set of systems. And there were hundreds of systems that made a bank go. And then I started hearing about this Bitcoin and you know, Bitcoin was something that was definitely kind of an out there concept in, for me, let's, let's just say kind of 2013, 2014, and I'm in the bank but there's nothing happening. There's, there's no one that's kind of interested in talking about that. And, uh, you know, it was too early at the time. Uh, I transit, so I found that, you know, it was just too big a pull. And in 2015, we all, like a number of us, and I, and I think, you know, it's probably when we originally met, uh, you know, Ethereum had just started its launch in the Toronto space. In, in 2015. So in 2015, um, we're, we're talking about this, you know, new decentralized uh, programmable version of Bitcoin, if you will. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the power of Bitcoin, even perhaps at, in 2015. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I saw that you could program and you could potentially program this Ethereum blockchain into a uh, you know into a set of autonomous decisions and moving value around trustlessly, I was hooked. So then then it kind of brought me back around to Bitcoin, uh, and that's uh, that's certainly when we met. And you know we we talked about you know time frame uh, in 2016. Uh, you know we were both I, you know, we were both doing meetups, and you know my my kind of flavor of the day was. Look at this! Uh, look at this new thing called the Ethereum blockchain, and you know we're going to show you that you know we were doing demos in in uh, you know Paytm's uh, basements, and and it was one of those you know look what look what tokens are, and, and, I, and I, you know, we had we had maybe you know 50, 100 people in these in these meetups that were uh, that were kind of joining us now, and looking at what the future of finance could be. So that was that's kind of the the beginning of my blockchain story, and and it comes from, uh, you know, me kind of seeing all of the, all of the, uh, you know, world's banking institutions kind of struggling with reconciliations, with with cross border payments, with with risk management. There were there were lots of problems, and and there continue to be, frankly, you know, problems and challenges with with the traditional or like legacy. Uh, banking system, and that's uh, that's really what drew me into the space. Is that interesting? Help? I, I, I'm yeah. just curious. So that that's a very uh, cool lens to be coming at, you know, this blockchain yeah. world at, from. <laughs> um, but I'm curious to know a little bit more. So okay, just to sum up a couple of things. So first of all, it seems like you were coming from 
uh, a household of entrepreneurs, right? These are the kind of the, the key True. points that I, I drew. So you had a bit of an entrepreneurial, uh, you know, lens into the world. You, you were a hardcore techie, almost seems like at a very young age and loved programming, right? And uh, I, I'll, yeah, I'll sorry, add one ahead. more thing. So uh, mm. you, you may, you know, you may know that uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of change in the world and different governments kind of take over. But at one point, uh, there, there's, there's an mm. important kind of additional point to this. And that's, that's the fact that I didn't, uh, that I wasn't actually born in Canada. So I was, uh, uh, I was, you know, but a baby and uh, brought to Canada as soon as the Russians invaded um, Czechoslovakia, and which became the Czech Republic. So, uh, so it was my dad that yeah. created an engineering firm and, be, you know, started to think entrepreneurially in this fantastic country that we call Canada, which was, you know, the future, you know, the, his, his future world and, and capitalism. So, uh, so that's, it's not just to say entrepreneurism, but it was, look, like there was a, there was a world that we came from and a world that you could not be an entrepreneur. It was a world that, you know, was, was now taken over by um, communist Russia. And, you know, we got out on essentially permanent vacation. So not a lot of people understand that story. Now everything's great. Uh, you know, I can go back. But at the time, I couldn't have even come back as a child back to, uh, to, to that um, country. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, Interesting. yeah, Crazy. it's quite a, quite a story when you think about uh, you know, immigrant parents, yeah. right? So another, 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 uh, you know, well, immigrant yourself, right? You yep. said you were born an immigrant. In yeah, born in Prague. I didn't know that. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I see a lot of like commonalities, right? Of people who choose uh, like entrepreneurship in this space. And it seems like, you know, one, one tends to be a uh, technical background, uh, definitely some sort of, you know, entrepreneurial um, like desire to, to want to do something bigger. Um, and also a global perspective, right? That's another thing that I find is like uh, people who've been around the world a bit uh, can really appreciate Bitcoin because uh, it helps you. I, I think for me, at least it, 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 I don't, I don't like traveling anymore, but I've done a lot of traveling in the past. And, and I find like that experience gives you, you know, kind of the ability to, to find what binds all of us and what's common, what's the common denominator among everyone. It really does. Having that uh, global perspective, and I find that with, uh, you know, traveling, traveling mm -hmm. in the past few years, even to, to the Ethereum Dev Developers Conferences uh, has, been, has been a fantastic experience. And, you know, coming, uh, uh, coming to, uh, you know, groups that have, you know, meeting them from all around the world and realizing that, that you can, you know, uh, work within a new kind of technology that, that can be accessible to everybody. And this, this is an important mm -hmm. point, right? The accessibility, the accessibility that, um, that, that we have, I think we've taken for granted in, let's say the, the, the Canadian North American space and, and other places, we, we take that so much for granted. And there was a time when, when we certainly couldn't uh, transfer funds very easily to, to you know, relatives that we had abroad. Uh, that, that stays with you. And then you realize uh, you know, the, world, the world can now be a, you know, a, a, a better place. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot that's happened since then. And uh, I, I can also tell you that I got, I got some of my best, uh, best training from uh, dealing with problems in, in large uh, financial institutions and in large companies, because, you know, you mm -hmm. realized that, uh, you know, they all struggled. They, they didn't have it. Uh, they didn't have it figured out. And, and there was these, you know, this, this spaghetti charts that we would have on walls of, of information systems that wouldn't talk to one another. There were, there were no proper, uh, you know, standards at the time. And, uh, and, and this, this is one of those uh, moments that, you, you know, you just see the building blocks and you connect the dots as, as Steve Jobs says, kind of after the fact. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you, you kind of, you pick one, 
you, you pick one dot and another dot and you realize, okay, now this, this new frontier, this, this new technology really has the potential of solving a lot of the, the world's problems. And, and that includes, you know, large corporations and, and others uh, and, and small as well. What, what would you say like this, this Bitcoin thing, this space mm -hmm. in general, what would you say, what problems, I mean, you could, you could go on and on about oh, so many, but like, if you had to pick, let's yeah. say one, maybe two major problems that this technology fixes, what would you say they are? I'm just curious, like, what was it that really caught your imagination? I, the, the fact that you could create a, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to bring the the token metaphor here, right? Uh, you know, the the fact that you could um, digitize and and basically bring a, a real world asset to uh, in a digital form, and then securely be able to transact it, transfer it, uh, make it accessible to to anyone in the world. Uh, was was pretty uh, it was pretty eye opening. So uh, so for me, it's it was a, a standardized way of of having a global, um, you know, the, the word value transfer is often used, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, for for all of this. But but anything that that could be a value then could easily be. Um, transformed uh, or into a digital form, and then and then uh, delivered to someone else. Now, I could I could tell you that you know, it, it the banking sector, okay, um, not not that um, you know there's there's a lot of value that the banks have created. Let's let's be clear, and they've they've created great payment rails and and all that. Now, there's also a reason why fintechs have been nibbling at uh, at fintechs or at the big banks for for a couple of decades now. And that's because there's a lot of inefficiency in in the space, uh, and and I was doing a let me let me give you a little, little example. Uh, so I was doing a conference. Um, it's probably three years ago now, and I had a bunch of CIOs around. Uh, you know these these were all these were world class CIOs, and they had never heard of Bitcoin. They had they had essentially not heard of digital currency or blockchain for that matter. And I presented this to them, and and it still didn't quite it didn't quite resonate. So what did I do at the table? Um, I mean, I, there was still there were a lot of questions. I think it resonated with the, with a number of folks, but there were questions. So I pulled out pulled out a wallet and I said, "Okay, so I've now uh, I've now got uh, I've got some digital currency here. To look to, you know, I have some Bitcoin in a wallet, and this Bitcoin I can I can get Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars for this Bitcoin pretty much any time I wish, and you know, it's that's possible. We have we have these exchanges, so so just assume that that is possible. Now I asked the I asked the uh, the table to start downloading their wallets, and and so they got a wallet. And you know, a couple of minutes later, I said, "Okay, now show me your QR code. I'm going to I'm going to zap this uh, uh, Bitcoin. I'll give you you know I'll give you a dollar of bit worth of Bitcoin." And and the person kind of looks at me and, you know, moments later, he kind of looks at his uh, digital wallet and, and her digital wallet across the table. Um, and, and it happened, by the way, that I got them to, to send it to each other. And, and the question was, okay, so is, is this efficient? Is this efficient? Uh, uh, yes, it seems that way. And I said, so how many financial institutions needed to be involved and needed to approve these payments, needed to essentially make it possible for you to send something of value from one person to another over the internet? And as soon as the answer was zero, they all got it. As soon as the first person said, not a single one, this was made possible through a new technology that sits on the sits on literally you know on top of the internet call it and uh, and it was now possible for them to see very very viscerally how this could change the banking infrastructure and and you know that i remember maybe a couple of them were were banking um you know banking folks but there were others there that that were in pharmaceuticals in in others uh, in other businesses and and they really Kind of immediately stood up and said, "Okay, so this this is going to be game changing." 
and uh, and that's that for me is you know seeing the seeing the penny drop for people was is something so some of us call you know uh, falling down the rabbit hole but uh, it it's the you know realization that you know there's there's really a uh, a game-changing new technology that doesn't require uh, that you know, in in the case of downloading a wallet and being able to to access this new uh, infrastructure and this this new um, the system of of moving uh, really anything of value and of course that was the Bitcoin case uh, really is is uh, is pretty powerful uh, and, and that's just yeah, the beginning yeah, yeah. right and that's just the beginning mm. because you know we. We at the time, if, if, yeah, let's let's continue this little rabbit hole a bit because at the time, uh, it was it was so early, and then then this then this you know member of the Ethereum community came out, and then they came up with something called the the um, ERC twenty, which which is essentially uh, an Ethereum proposal, right? Um, and it was the 20th proposal in, in Ethereum and said, you know, I propose a, a standard. I, I propose something called a token standard, something that can uh, accept ether, the, the, you know, the, the digital currency or the, the currency of the, uh, the native currency of the Ethereum blockchain and also represent um, anything, anything you wish, really, as as a, an asset, and we'll call that a token. And you know, now any number of wallets can be essentially become owners or token holders of of this new asset, and it's worldwide right away. And I knew, I knew that this was going to be the start part of a new asset class. And so, you know, yeah, I think we were, we were all together there and, and I was doing some demos around, you know, how do, how do you create a, a token initially? Well, the base was so simple, something that really had some really basic functions and which essentially could act like a, like a bank account, uh, could, could act like a, a shareholder register, could act like a, uh, a you know, a, uh, a fractional ownership unit, and all all in a matter of you know a few dozen lines of code in in its most basic form, put into the Ethereum blockchain and then made available to everybody. That was that was pretty amazing at the time. I th I think it was just you know it's such such a eye opener for for myself for sure and and, and for everyone else. And, and of course, we've seen now, you know, a couple of years, few years later, what, what's transpired and we can talk all about that. Um, yeah, so many questions. Okay, well, let's just, let's just, mm. let's just focus on your story. So what, 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 what's, what's next on, on, on your story front in the sense that, okay, so now you've, uh, okay. you've had this aha moment with, uh, with Bitcoin, with, with Ethereum and well, Bitcoin to start with, but then yeah. the programmable nature, the Turing completeness, if you will, of Ethereum drew you in as, okay. as a much more multi-purpose platform for anyone to, or any company or any entity to, to launch a Bitcoin-esque uh, type of thing, right? Obviously not Bitcoin, but, but, right. but, but a token that, that, that has the same, maybe not, you know, limited number of Bitcoins and all of that, but, but it does preserve the ability to move funds uh, as seamlessly as you can move, you know, ether essentially um, from one party to the next in a way that doesn't require middlemen um, and financial institutions. And so this caught your imagination. You're like, okay, there's something here. What, what's next? Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. And you know, what's next was the the what's next was okay. This this is going to be this is going to be big. I can do something in this space. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to put it. Uh, I'll put it like this. There was a lot of talk going on, and uh, it was just, it was just really early. And I was, uh, I had, I had seen a lot of people um, start to you know, talk about the space, but I wasn't going to talk about it as much as I wanted to actually do something. So I wanted to make something. So this was back to, you know, back to. 
early days and in the 2000s when I was actually making something. And, and, uh, and, and now we've got another opportunity, another opportunity to make something. So where will it go? We don't know. But we started Token Funder in the fall of 2016. Now, that was, act, that was around the same time that um, the uh, Securities Commission here, the Ontario Securities Commission, created something called their Launchpad. And I, I had, uh, I had in, in some ways, it was really kind of circumstance that I had to come in. I presented as Blockchain Canada to the commission in the uh, in the in the twenty six you know the summer of twenty sixteen and uh, it was it was pretty clear to me that um, there were a lot of questions and that there was a lot of knowledge that I had um, that that may that didn't exist there and I, I presented I presented something called you know the future of capital markets and. It, it basically said, you, there, there's this, there, here's what Bitcoin is, here's what Ethereum is, here's the programmable nature of it. And that was, uh, that was really in a, in a spirit of sharing. And it was exactly around the time that the launch pad uh, you know, was, was starting that we said, okay, we're going to do Token Funder. And, and then, then I came back and I said, okay, so I want to do Token Funder. I want to do this. Uh, you know, I want to, I, I see want maybe one or two of these um, coin offerings that are going to happen. And, and I, I pulled up the terms and conditions and I said, look at these terms and conditions. You're basically, uh, you're not getting anything. You're not, uh, you know, you're, you're not necessarily getting anything that, that you can, um, you can point to. There's, the, there's, there's a couple of these teams that, that seem to be legit. There's a few others, by the way, that, that are really kind of hiding behind anonymity. And why don't we do it right? Why don't we actually, why don't we take, why don't we take the approach that um, will work with the commission to establish uh, a framework that we can uh, launch a, a token in a, in a sense through the Canadian regulatory regime. So uh, you know, that was, that was a, a vision. Now, by the way, I did say, and, and oh, by the way, we'd like to accept all digital currencies of Bitcoin and, and, um, and Ether, and, uh, and, and we're going to be able to, to make this available to, to anyone in the world. And, you know, it'll be, uh, it, it'll be one of the greatest things because we'll have capital flowing into Canadian companies. And uh, you can imagine that some of the reaction included, well, you just can't do that. That's, that's not allowed. That's that's not something that will fly here, and that's something that um, you know. Oh, oh, and by the way, here's here's a four inch you know securities manual that you should read up by uh, read up on uh, by next you know meeting so that that we can have uh, so that we can all be on the same page. Which then takes us to you know a part of this story, which uh, which is about where can we where can we change? Where can we make change? Where, how, how do we get change to actually happen? So after kind of many months of uh, explaining you know, internally behind kind of closed doors, how the, um, how the Bitcoin blockchain worked, how, how you know, transactions are accomplished, how anyone can get wallets, how, how, how tokens can be created and all that. So lots of demos internally with within closed doors and, and all of that uh, that we we came to and said okay we we want to we want to do a security token we want to be the you know we want to be the regulatory approved security token and you know this is in 2017 when they're they're coming to us to say well you, there, there's like you know billions of dollars flowing through these unregulated securities. You can, you know, make let's let's give you some leeway in our sandbox, in our in our launch pad to do this. You know, in a way that we're comfortable with. So let's let's give you exemptive relief. So so that was the really the beginning of exemptive relief. And what that means is, you know, there are certain there are certain regulatory, uh, you know, uh, laws on the books that say you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Uh, but as a as a startup. 
and the first to come through the launch pad and really walk through the, the history of, of blockchain and, and paint the picture of where this was going, uh, we, we established, um, yeah, we established a, a relationship which included, uh, you know, these, these, um, you know, these, these elements to, you know, allowing us to, to do something that, uh, that, that they were comfortable with. And, and we, we, we accepted ether, we accepted, um, ether for, for payment of a security token, which we said we would, we would, as, as we grew this platform, we would share the profits of the platform in terms of dividends and they would be made available. So, so there was a real offering memorandum, something that, you know, white papers certainly weren't delivering all over the world in, in, the, in the 2017 ICO craze. And, you know, I would, I would read a white paper and it would say, uh, you, you have no rights, by the way, this is a donation of your Bitcoin or your Ether and you will get some tokens and, and guess what? <laughs> and, and that was, that was kind of the extent of it. And, and there were people that were, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, transactions in it. Um, ours, ours was completely, uh, well, ours was different. But it said, here's a real world offering memorandum that people can understand. It scared people off, by the way, Let, let's be honest. And it scared some of the crypto community off, but here's a real world offering memorandum. And you can tell that there's a real world company behind it that is regulated by um, a securities body and uh, will provide you with audited financials, that sort of thing. So, so that's, that's how we came out of the gate with, with a regulated security token. That is insane. Uh, okay, well, what an awesome story. So I just want to, I just like summing up stuff because it helps me understand and maybe it'll help others. Um, but okay, so you have this aha moment. You're thinking, okay, the world's already moving ahead and creating these ICOs, but they're doing it in a very, uh, how do you want to say it? Uh, very loose, very loose, loose in terms of di yeah. disclosure and uh, and very non-transparent way. I'll, I'll add because we, I could, I could demonstrate that the insiders were buying the coins, and and I could, I you could, you could see it. Exactly, so, so they were so, doing things that were not cool. Let's put it that way by regulators. Um, and, and, and I mean, you know, and um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead and summarize it because it was really not cool for anyone that if you think about it, unless you're an absolute speculator. So it kind of turned you from an investor to a speculator. Yeah. And, and this was, and this is why I wanted to have this talk with you because I like what you're doing in the sense that let me just back up a bit. So I, I'm, as you know, a bit of a Bitcoin maximalist and, and to my detriment, I would say to some extent. Right. Um, but, but my, one of my beefs with, was, was this kind of this, ICO craze, if you will, just like the fact that anybody and everybody was whipping up a white paper that looked legit and was just raising tons of money and, and kind of uh, on a speculative project that they hadn't even like really figured out how to build or whatever. And they were taking money from their next door neighbors to do this. And you don't need it to be a regulator to know that that that's kind of like scary and not cool. And they just had a bit of verbiage near the end that would say, oh, okay, you know, like you said, this is a donation, this is, you don't expect anything, da, 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 da. So that was definitely worrisome. Um, regulators are freaking out. I remember even you know, the events I was doing back in the day, you know, a lot of the people from OSC were, were kind of, you know, they were at these events sitting front row and center, paying attention, um, making sure that they took notes. And, 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 you know, and so kind of seeing all the different pieces of the puzzle, I, I was always very concerned around what was kind of happening in our industry. And so you said, okay, well, this isn't cool. Let's try and put some guardrails on here, just enough for the, for the regulators to feel comfortable, just enough so that we're not necessarily, you know, doing this anonymously and, and in a way where people couldn't be held responsible. Sorry, go ahead on. Yeah, no, no, no. I think you're, you're, you're on, you're exactly on it. I'll, I'll add something else. I, I've, I think we have a little time, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll add here's, here's where we were at. So I, I looked, of course, we looked around the world and uh, followed Ethereum, the project itself, which, which of course started in Canada, but pretty soon, where was it? It was in Switzerland. Why? Mm. Why was it in Switzerland? Well, because the project, and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of other places where you can get this history. The project could not get the regulatory 
um, approval or could not get the regulatory comfort that uh, that it could survive in in Canada, US, and maybe in UK. So Switzerland, and and it was uh, you know to the um, to the credit or or you know. Uh, let's let's say made them famous there there were a couple of, there was one law firm in particular um and a couple you know following um that uh, created kind of the cookie cutter approach to running icos out of switzerland and well it, it, there's no doubt by the way that you know there was regulatory arbitrage happening because you could say and and it was part of the conversation that i had you could say look what's happening in you know jurisdiction, you know, look at Switzerland in that jurisdiction, they're letting it happen. Well, it was always a, it was always a, a bit of a back and forth to, okay, they're letting it happen, but they're still not giving people good disclosure. You're still getting the, you know, this is a donation and those white papers, a lot of them were coming out of the, the Swiss space. And, and it turned out that we said, okay, well, we want some of that, but we want to, we want some of that, and we want to make it happen here in Canada. How are we going to? How are we going to do that? So we had to. We had to come up with some compromises. We added, know your client right away. So we had to do KYC um, for our investors. Um, that was not. That was not a requirement of the Swiss space. So companies, you know, many, 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 many of these startups went to Switzerland because. You know, they were they were going to be able to accomplish their objectives, get a lot of and call it anonymous cash in the in the form of Bitcoin and, e and Ether for their projects. And then maybe, you know, take the Uber approach and say, let's just do it. Let's just, you know, do it, do it as as we need to and backfill whatever legal things we need to kind of, uh, you know, support this in the future. But but now we'll have a big, uh, you know, cash reserve for for legal issues. Um, I, I, that's, that's the, that's essentially you know, an important part of this story. And, uh, you know what, and, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Right. I mean, I, I think that's, that's actually a big part of this story, even going forward, this regulatory arbitrage, this international, uh, you know, um, accessibility, it's, it's always going to be here. And, uh, you know, it's it's a business. At the end of the day, we we all we all know that you know you make a business decision as to whether you want to go to to Switzerland or do you want to stay in in Canada and how do you want to interact, right? So uh, you know we take one route, um, and by the way, it made it harder for us, and that's that's just a decision you make at the end of the day. Um, now we're we're gonna I, th I think we're gonna come to you know there's still today that this is still happening in terms of you know regulatory arbitrage and such uh but i think we've we've solved some of the problems that uh, hey, uh, i have a question i have a, so this is such a like important yeah. point right but like at ultimately the regulators in canada are worried about or are concerned about you know keeping the average person safe, right? I mean, that's what they're concerned about. So given this context of regulatory arbitrage where companies are just going elsewhere yeah. um, and given how Bitcoin, Ethereum and blockchains work, yeah, um, exactly. Canadians are still getting exposure to these from international uh, exchanges and whatnot. And so ultimately the person is not being protected. So you're play we're playing all these games and doing all these things, but ultimately, uh, you know, so, so I, I always, I'm, but I'm always curious about protecting people. I'm not curious, but I'm always a bit skeptical about like protecting people through, let's say just the rule of law, right? Mainly because, you know, uh, I'm going to be going live with a video, I think in the next little while with, with, that I did recently with Addison, you know, and we talked about how the law is, is such an interesting thing, but, you know, most of it is not even applicable because there's no enforcement with and so so understanding kind of where law exists and then understanding the subset of laws that yeah. are you know where enforcement is actually um you know uh, emphasized upon is is a different question and and it just brings into the question like what is the purpose of this like again i'm all about protecting the little guy and etc cetera, etc cetera, but how does 
like given the, and I'm not advocating, definitely not advocating for some sort of global government. Um, that would be like the dystopian future. But, 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 you, but, gotta, but, you know, be careful that, what you wish for. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, to a large extent, I mean, global governments do exist, right? There are regulators of regulators. If you, I'm sure you're following, um, like, have you heard of FATF? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So have you heard of, you know, like, so, so there are entities that look after all of this. And so just curious, just curious. So like, when does, where does regulatory, regulatory arbitrage meet up against these global regulators where now you're just, you know, where you're essentially forced to, to follow the rules, right? Uh, okay. That's a really big question. And, mm -hmm. and I will say this. Uh, all right. So what's, what's, What's the real purpose, right? So protecting protecting the average person, um, especially when when they're not, let's say, um, knowledgeable enough about what what's in front of them. Okay, so so here I think we've made I think we've made great strides, um, but we're not there yet. So we have we have investors. And uh, that you know are, are classified in in today's world, and they're accredited investors. And you know you're a well you're a wealthy person. You're a, you're an accredited investor, right? So you can you can prove your wealth. And pretty much the 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 laws say you can do pretty much what you want with your money because you could take your risks really really high level of risk, no problem, because you apparently can you know withstand the the loss, right? Uh, and and then there's there's a kind of a, a an average middle tier, which which in the Canadian terms we call an eligible investor, and then there's a non-eligible or retail investor, in in the Canadian uh, terms. And these are these are terms that are interchangeable with with others in, in you know the U.S. and the U.K. and such. Where, where I had an issue with this is that uh, an average person in in some of these markets um, by by law was was essentially limited to like ten thousand dollars of of investment into um, this this you know these new higher risk if you will asset classes um, and you know an accredited sorry investor, ten thousand uh, dollars a year uh, yes a, a year a year yeah. so an accredited okay. investor can can basically do anything they want and not have any knowledge about okay let's let's just say there there's some that absolutely do but an accredited investor can also be an accredited investor that has no knowledge of the crypto space but is just gonna you know is it's able to withstand the losses and so you know you can have someone that's very knowledgeable about the crypto space and and has you know, lots of you know programming intelligence, and you know knows where the space is going, and wants to wants to really double down. And there's and there's guidelines and limits, which which I think you just, know. Just are, to be clear on that, just to be clear on that, Alan. Sorry, this is so fascinating. But just to be clear on that, are there limits on the individual that they are not allowed, or is it the other way around where the entities taking the money can do it's, so? It's literally on the both. individual. It's, it's literally. That is so. That it's, is so what bizarre. It is. It's and, what uh, it is. What sorry, it is. are you back? That's so bizarre because okay, look, look, look. Okay, just to back up. Uh, uh, philosophically speaking, I, I definitely don't like the like if when I'm if I'm building a speculative business, I like the idea of being able to go to a wealthy individual or an investment firm that has lots of money that even if they give me a hundred grand or whatever, if we lose it, God forbid, and we tried everything in our power to not. Um, I like the fact that you know it lets me sleep at night. So, um, but but and 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 so personally, I don't want to take money from my neighbor, even if he was like, take it. Like I know you're going to do well. I don't want it. Yeah. So, but 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 where, where it kind of breaks apart for me is is that I still don't believe. I still believe in freedom, though. I mean, I still believe that people should be allowed to do what they want, especially with their own property, right, or their own. Um, or their, their own assets. So I am just, so I, so I find I, it a bit concerning or weird that there are rules where, like you said, even if somebody, like, because risk is a function of information and control, right? So, so yes, one person with a lot of money has more, you know, assets and ability to take risk. 
But like you said, somebody with a high level of knowledge or information about something is de-risking themselves by by educating themselves. So how 100%. does the law account for that? So very hundred percent. It's, yeah, it's not. And I, and I love Addison, by the way. So so I'm glad to to hear that you've got him on uh, as well. I haven't um, haven't seen his. I, you know, it's podcast. coming live, I think, tomorrow or something. Right, right. I mean, so we're <laughs> we're recording this uh, before I had a chance to see it, which is great. Uh, but I, I certainly, uh, you know, I certainly know, uh, and, and we've had a number of great conversations around this. He's, he's a great lawyer uh, in the space. I will say that this this is our challenge, really, because you know you've got you've got something that is permissionless, so you can you can become a participant in a global financial system, which which some would argue is is potentially competitive to our existing financial system, right? I mean, complementary, competitive, it, it's, it's all going to happen over time um, in, in Bitcoin terms. And now we've got the, and we've also have this, you know, and, and Ethereum is not the only programmable, programmable blockchain now. I, I'm referring to it because uh, I've, I've been watching this, this space very closely and as we started here. And our platform is built on Ethereum, uh, on the Ethereum public blockchain. But this is where this is where the biggest challenge is, is because you can be very knowledgeable of the space and and not be and, and if, in effect not be able to participate in some um, offerings which which are legit security offerings to beyond a certain limit in in the market. Now, why is that? Um, Oh, I, hold on. Before I get to why is that, uh, you, you reminded me of something that, that sometimes we talk about uh, in, in with others is there, there's other examples where uh, there's, there's really, let's, let's say you want to, you, you've, you've got, um, you've got the wherewithal and, and you've got more risk appetite than someone else. And you think that that, uh, you know, that new shiny car down the street uh, uh, at the dealership is, is going to go up in value. And so you, you, you can, without any securities regulator uh, looking over your shoulder or giving you any limit, you you can buy that you know seventy thousand dollar car, hundred thousand dollar car. Nobody's going to tell you that you can't. But as soon as it is a security in in our securities space, someone can tell you WTF that you, that, that you can't. <laughs> or and, and and you can. So so if you think that it will go up in value, that's a that's that's the kind of nature of you know there's there's some potential speculation there. You want utility, maybe you love it, maybe you'll park it, maybe you know that's one thing. Somebody else used the analogy with me uh, that there's no one stopping you from you know buying hundred thousand dollars worth of of uh, hamburgers this year and just you know that's that's all you eat. That's your risk, right? Uh, no one is stopping you from doing that because it's not a security. So as soon as we get yeah. into as soon as we get into investment products, our financial system has grown up because. And I presented, I think, at one of your meetups when, when you know you had a you had a, a very uh, kind of groundbreaking large conference. I shouldn't call it a meetup because it was a conference here in the city. And but you know you had global people attending. It was fantastic. I presented there in one of the you know one of your slots, and I said, look look back what happened. The twenties happened, and there was a you know public offerings, and and they got to a point where they were just you know taking people's money with no regard about anything, and so what happened? The this securities regulation came in after the fact in the thirties and established the guide guardrails and established this financial infrastructure of the SEC of the you know of securities commissions around the world, and what happened was. It was a reaction to people getting ripped off, and you know ultimately it, was, it wasn't fair to, to people. And so, you know, we have something that's existed now for will be will be a hundred years um, with not too long, right? And now we have an opportunity. I mean, I look forward now. Now we have an opportunity, and we're seeing um, a lot of different kind of dots out there. And, uh, and and I'd like to I'd like to share with you, you know, where we're going with Token Funder in a minute, but I'll but I'll but I'll stop you know continue on this path of where are we where are we today? Okay, so we have we have a I think both the um, the 
you know, the US and the Canadian and, and Canada has, you know, good solid treaties with like UK and Singapore and, and others uh, from a security um, uh, standpoint. But now, you know, we're in a position that uh, we have we have more progressive, we have more knowledgeable regulators, 100% in 2020, we have knowledgeable regulators that that can say, you, you know, we understand what's happening generally. And, uh, you know, the OCC in the US said that banks can now hold cryptocurrency. And so now there's a realization, okay, that this Bitcoin thing is real and, and is, uh, it, is, well, what was that, you know, by the way? Well, what entity said the, that? The, OC... the OCC, the um, OCC, uh, sorry, it's the, two the controller words. of, uh, of um, uh, chief office of the uh, currency controller. Um, that's that's important, right? Hey, do you remember uh, when I had Edmund Moy come and speak at my event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the thirty-eighth. Uh, that's right. Uh, that... Director of the U.S. Mint. Right. It, that was one of my yeah 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 I, I, I did I was in the audience for him I was in the audience so, <laughs> yeah yeah okay anyways, so continue, so, continue. so yeah. you know this this is this is the this is the important thing because now uh, again it'll it'll come back around to what we're trying to accomplish here but um, where we're at today is think about all the money printing that's going on people are starting to be concerned about you know the the, the fact that there's there's massive debt going to happen in the uh, in the call them the developed worlds like the US has, has basically been buying up uh, printing money then buying up debt um, this this is this is a real kind of debt bubble and uh, you know you've you've got our existing you know decades and and uh, and you know centuries old if financial infrastructure but by the way of course we know that you know the, the fed really only happened to in the 1900s and and now has and and then we got the securities commission um come on top of that so you know the history is there and we're we're now at a point though that we have massive debt loads that that are arguably unsustainable and we're going to end up with another one of these global resets um, we you know there's there's other dots here and and they're they're probably for another time but but think back to you know what was working at one time was the USD was was uh, pegged against gold until you know from the Bretton Woods agreement after world war 2 and the the world economy kind of worked and then 71 turns around and the US says, we're no longer pegging to gold. You can't just convert to gold. Uh, that's not gonna happen. So Bretton Woods is off. Now it's kind of a free for all. And- uh, uh, By the way, you know, Bretton Woods is being revisited this year, right? Well, well, that's that's the talk, right? Like that. it's, it, that's, that's, it, that's where the IMF is, right? Because the IMF, and Christine Lagarde, even a couple of years ago, and I've been I've been talking about this with um, you know we I probably even mentioned it at, at one of your conferences, um, as as I recall, because this has happened over the last few years. Excuse me, that uh, the IMF has has said you know our our global financial system is is under strain, and and look, we can't we can no longer. And Christine Lagarde said this when when she was there, we can no longer um of you know not think about what this new digital currency world looks like and that was bitcoin at the time we can't we can't not think about it so all the central banks should start thinking about their own central bank digital currency and this this then takes us to where we are today because they are all thinking about it and the imf of course had their uh their kind of global conference that uh, that was televised on october 19th and they said you know there, there's 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 this potential for this this new Bretton Woods kind of uh, get get together, right? So so Bretton Woods makes, basically means we we need global cooperation, and global cooperation as, as to how uh, you know the financial world's going. And now now we have it's sunny. I know I know this this kind of comes back around to you know Bitcoin stories is we're getting stable coins, we're getting, you know, every, every country is going to have stable coins, but in a way, uh, because they're saying, you know, we, we, we want to control our, our own uh, monetary and, and fiscal policy. 
and they're going to have they're going to end up being somewhat op, uh, interoperable maybe but here we already have a, you know we have an example of a global digital currency called bitcoin that exists today and that they're all taking uh, they're all taking pointers from it of course um anyway more more dots right and, yeah, and last year OECD? last year we had libra heard, and so libra have you heard of the oecd it's, 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 it's have you heard of the oecd of course yeah so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how does the OECD relate? Well, to the, the IMF, IMF is actually the the global financial. Okay, so they're mm. the they're the one, and BIS. So BIS Bank of Infra, Bank of International Settlements is is kind of the overarching um, regulator of, of financial institutions around of central the, banks. The, the final the, the the final Bitcoin boss, as people like to yeah, like like the BIS <laughs> and, <laughs> and the really IMF, good. and the IMF has something called special depository receipt, receipts that that essentially are like a global currency already, and they they interact with the central banks around the world and they coordinate this way. Um, a lot of people don't really understand, you know, necessarily those roles. Uh, but they're they're going to now start implementing the kind of technology that that was spawned by Bitcoin and then by you know, the, the programmable nature of a value in in Ethereum because you know essentially uh, you know there's there's a race on now and of course Libra last year kind of threw everything into chaos right because there's there's Facebook saying why don't we just take a basket of these you know global stable coins we're going to be a global currency that was that was like that that was the shot across Alan, the Alan, 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 I, I because of a lot of the stuff that's going on uh with uno coin in india last year i got while i was working for kraken i got invited to go speak at the oecd yeah. in paris <laughs> <laughs> about my experience and the video is out there somewhere on their website i, did, I missed and, that uh, i'm sorry i'll have to, I'll have to highlight, go get it the, uh, i think it's you gotta like cl click like 25 different things on their web page to find okay. it uh, it's it's like it's like the best ux ever okay, okay. but anyway so i I was gonna say is that that was one of the most like mind-blowing experiences ever um i remember on the final day of that blockchain oecd event they literally had just picture this they literally had the head of the facebook digital currency yeah. guy yeah. on stage um and a room full of central bankers yeah. <laughs> I, I believe it and and they all then they came back and they said uh, in the u.s well that's that's not going to happen on our watch because you know you're not gonna you're not gonna set monetary policy. You're not you're gonna you're not going to you know to decide how much you know how much is out there and and what the what the rates are. It, it was uh, it was pretty. It would it could have been groundbreaking, but but it was also uh, okay. So so that's yeah, good that's, good that's a good place to stop, I think. But I mean, this is this is validated by you know as as a. As as a point in time in 2020, we've had the, we've had COVID um, hit us hard, right? So, so there's there's been a there's been a great kind of uh, rethinking of um, where does stimulus come from? How can stimulus happen? And and the Fed said uh, uh, kind of monetizing a whole bunch of debt again. And then you have uh, today's world where you have. Um, I mean, I find this fascinating, but also very concerning. And and we have, we all, I think, need to be very uh, kind of attuned to where this is headed because uh, not only does uh, you know does does the Libra story kind of uh, bring that to to the front, and then IMF coming to the table saying, okay, we need we need another potentially another one of these. Uh, global aligned Bretton Woods moments with the G10, the IMF, the BIS uh, coming together. But then there's China that's that's obviously doing their their digital currency now. And you know they're they're ahead of of others by by all accounts and, and they're taking it very seriously. So is China going to be part of that? We don't know. But what we do know is that you know we've got a, a couple of things happening and Ray Dalio I think was was really Kind of uh, seminal this year in putting together, um, you, know, uh, you know, he's he's obviously had a, a, a great track record. Um, his, his his kind of three things right now is that we we're coming to the you know we're coming to an end of a, a monetary cycle that's going to need a global reset. There's way too much uh, you know government debt out there, and and we also we've also built this wealth gap. 
So, so those, those that have, uh, those that were wealthy before COVID actually got much wealthier um, than, than, uh, than the average person, right? So we need to, we need to fix that. And we've got to, when we've, then the other challenge, obviously, or the other uh, big thing to, to be looking at is that uh, the China is uh, has been on the march for for a couple of decades now, and and has is positioned to potentially become that next uh, you know reserve currency because we went from we went from you know historically let's let's say you know the the British reserve currency at one time, then then the U.S. at uh, at World War II became the re world's reserve currency. Now, very likely, and Dalio's uh, you know Dalio believes this. You know, China becomes the world's uh, uh, reserve currency. Or Sunny, if you're or Bitcoin. Bitcoin maximalist, or does or Bitcoin. Bitcoin or does or Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Or, I, I love or does, Ray Dalio. Or does Bitcoin? Really? I love Ray Dalio. I read all his books, uh, but he's wrong. He needs to get on the Bitcoin. No, bandwagon. he's. he's I think. I think he could get on the Bitcoin bag. I, uh, he's China? not there yet. I mean, really, he's not there China, yet. You think the whole world's going to agree to a Chinese bag reserve currency? Oh, who's who? Right, right. Good, good point. Right, excellent point. Um, mm -hmm. Doubtful, um, but well, well, what if, a, what will if, they have a if, choice? Sorry, what if, what if, what if instead of the Chinese uh, bag currency, what if there was an open source? decentralized right <laughs> distributed network that you could build oh okay you know where i'm going with but this. what okay. is that okay. what, i wonder we're, what that we're, is okay. we're already like an hour and 10 minutes in and we haven't okay. even talked about token funder okay by the way i am just gonna say is i'm down to do this again like if you wanna if we can't cover all our ground we can do it again next I'm, week I'm, and if you want to save some as well but um but i, I do want to get a bit into maybe before it'd be a good thing to just maybe give us like an elevator pitch on token funder because we've danced around it and talked about sure. osc and uh, you got regulatory i guess some sort of uh, green light um but but what is it now today you know what are you trying to do and and then kind of maybe back into the story or whatever you want to do there yeah there's two there's two pieces of a story and that's uh that's where we began and where we're going and um, from a from an original token funder vision, we always believed that we can build a, a digital security security token. At the time, wasn't really the name of it, but uh, digital security um, offering marketplace. And so, it's it, there's two things in in terms of what the reg, you know how we describe this in regulatory terms. There's the primary, and then there's the secondary. So, primary means that you're going out and you're you're going to raise some capital for a project, company, etc. So we began uh, as as a as an entity doing our own token offering, and we built it so that we could do it for others. And now a company can become an issuer on our platform, and we've uh, we've got the full platform uh, baked with KYC and investor onboarding, and we distribute a digital security uh, through the platform, which then. In in our you know marketplace uh, terms uh, can subsequently be tradable amongst others. So in the in the in the simple terms, issuing digital securities for companies that are issuers. So we became a what's called um, a dealer or an exempt market dealer, which is is really the private market. So opposed to, as opposed to the public markets where private market um, registered dealer with the Securities Commission, that gives us the uh, permission and the um, authority to issue financial securities on behalf of companies as part of their capital raise. Now, once they have that, we also very, very, you know, you know uniquely, and nobody else has this um, in Canada, um, we worked to create a decentralized trading mechanism such that if you have some, if you have some, um, uh, we have, we have a token in our, in our system called the FNDR, which is the, which were the tokens that people bought. Um, now if you can come to our, our platform in, um, in the near future, and, and we'll have another video around this, uh, such that you can have uh, you can have your FNDR token, and someone else uh, wants to buy some from you. We've built essentially like a, a marketplace that uh, works in a decentralized way, and this this is extremely unique, such that we as a platform don't get involved, but you can trade peer to peer. So there's the primary and there's the secondary. 
um, piece of this. Uh, the secondary huge, you know, huge innovation. We've we built it on. Um, uh, we built it on the Ethereum blockchain with with some uh, with something called the decentralized exchange uh, protocols like zero X, for example. Um, and we're taking it to we're taking it to new levels. I'll even give you a, I, I'll, I'll give you a preview of something that um, uh, we just recently launched, and it's in our. Uh, I can give you that preview if. Uh, if in a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll share my screen with you. Yeah, I'll give you um, control here as well. Yeah, yeah, just uh, we will do that. Um, but but this is where it gets. This is where we want to you know see the world or where we see the world. Um, Wait, so just let, just to sum up again in my my my, my, my uh, layman terms here. So you, I mean, a lot of big words there, but essentially at the end of the day. Oh, can I say first? I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard of many like actual whoops security token platform offerings that are you know that have some sort of regulatory exemption. Um, so maybe the first. I don't know. At least according to me, uh, mm -hmm. it is a security token platform. So that's a mouthful for saying that if somebody has a company and they want to raise money um on the blockchain but do it in a way that is um that is i guess accepted by at least ontario security commission no, canadian. Regu canadian, canadian regulators yeah. then and now 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 okay wait just just to clarify a couple of things so anybody in the world can use this platform to raise capital or just canadians and the second is uh, on the flip side, can anybody only in Canada invest or or like put money into this or whatever, or can anyone in the world? So yeah, two questions. <clears throat> these are really uh, there's there's these are really good questions and their nuances. And I'll give you the straight answer is that number one, anyone can invest um, in in a company. Uh, there are, there are a couple of guidelines around this. However, today um, the the primary is really uh, Open to all Canadians, all levels, right? Um, so, so for starters, that's that's an important piece. But a company can also, we can also raise from um, uh, we, anyone in the world, as long as they're not a sanctioned country. They're not, you know, there's there's certain you know financial sanctions that we can't deal with. Um, and the reason we can do that is because we have the KYC built in. Now we can't easily, and, and this is a, a nature of the, um, again, the, the regulatory uh, cross-border, uh, it takes someone that's a, that's a retail investor out of the US um, into, a, a, into a Canadian offering um, without, without a couple of extra hurdles, but uh, it is possible. It is possible. I mean, it's, it's up to adding a little, um, it's up to adding something to the, to the Canadian um, offering documents, really. And we can also we can also uh, partner with a, a broker dealer or you know in the same space as us in another country and then you know, they they have uh, a client that can invest in in a Canadian offering. Um, yeah, that's anyone in that's the world the, can invest, uh, but there's KYC and they're limited to ten grand. Or are you? Or what is that? Like you know so how the, you're saying? It, it, so yeah. it's always accredited. Accredited is is one of those you know. Uh, terms that goes across, uh, but yeah, the credit investors can can invest, um, and there they, there are no limits. There are no limits. There are other. Uh, we've we've applied the limits, the Canadian limits, to our uh, to our platform today, and and there are, uh, and and so someone. In Sorry, the anyone can invest, but they need to be an accredited investor, meaning they need to be super wealthy, or if, can if, normal people also partake? I, like normal, the, not no, super I'll wealthy people. <laughs> I'll say it again because it's not actually yeah, 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 easy, yeah, yeah. and and I, I appreciate that it's you know it, it's without without talking about any sort of regulation. Then anyone that is an accredited investor, full stop, right? Can then when you when you look at um, the you know retail level, wait, that anyone that isn't or is sorry, is, sorry, is okay, anyone is, that is an accredited is, investor can okay, so got that, yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the easy part, right? Then, then the uh, then the retail or the the non-accredited. There's a couple of levels of that, um, and and they can invest, uh, but in the in the U.S., there we we'd have we have to partner with another um, broker dealer in the U.S. to make it possible for for the retail level. So that's. Um, 
that's that. But we have these agreements in Canada that that you know span to UK and to the uh, and to Singapore, and so we've got new kind of treaties that we're going to take advantage of for our international um, international uh, offerings. So you know, it's a uh, it, it's been a it's really been a kind of a, a road to, to, you know, one step at a time. And, you know, we got, again, in, 20, uh, in 2018, we did the first security token offering, it, you know, for one of the first legal ones, I even say. Um, and then we, we became a, the first exempt market dealer that's allowed to issue digital securities on a blockchain. So again, you know, another milestone there. But what, where we're trying to get to is the the tradability ultimately, and that's where uh, we're going to have some new announcements coming up um, with with uh, for another podcast. We'll have uh, we'll yeah. have our secondary marketplace. Um, however, there's there's something that uh, I can show you today, and mm -hmm. and, and it's a uh, it, it gives you it gives you really a picture of the uh, of of the future, right? And I think uh, if I can take uh, I can do share screen now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should have uh, the ability. Yeah, now. I should be able to share screen, and I'm going to pick. Uh, I'm going to pick this over here, and I'll actually move it. Uh, just a second. Uh, are you seeing it? Yep. Are you seeing? Wrap Nest Capital. Okay. Okay. So good. So you you are seeing because it's uh, it's actually Zoom normally highlights it, but um, is it just? Do you see the two tabs in um, at the top here? Yep, I see both tabs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So you see both tabs. Let me just begin with let me just begin with um, Token Funder. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the starting point, and Nest Capital. Nest Capital is an issuer on our platform. What they do is they take capital and they're a mortgage investment corporation. So what they what they do is take that capital and uh, make mortgages and they offer it to uh, to invest. They basically offer it to residential um, uh, Canadians that uh, need uh, need a, a short term mortgage and uh, they've been in business uh, for for many years, uh, four years, and they've been at it for uh, eight years now. Uh, and they've they've got a model such that you know they they're not. It's called it's called a mortgage investment corporation because you can become a shareholder in their business. They make profits when they uh, when they basically uh, make these mortgages and they get paid back. And you know, given the given the nature of the kind of mortgages, and these are not subprime; these are actually good mortgages at uh, at good uh, at, at good uh, you know, uh, good due diligence and everything. And they have a full offering memorandum, fully regulated by you know the the um, in the Canadian space. Uh, so this is a real world issuer making real world profits okay so if, just curious, if now just, if i'm an investor if i'm hmm. an investor in in nest capital right yeah. now and uh and they turn around and make a hundred dollars of profits they they are uh by by law and this is the way that mortgage investment corporations are set up in canada they are by law they, they distribute all the profits as a flow through to their investors Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And by the way, these are mortgages. Are these the people that aren't going to banks that are getting like mortgages type of thing or like, well, they could, they, they could be at a bank, but they need to top up. Right. Uh, because, you know, they've had, um, you know, they've had, uh, they've had another need and they've got already it. got, they've already got something there, okay. you know, it's, there's, they're short. So, so, so what's happening here? What, so, what I'm seeing here. So, yeah. So what, what, what am so I what's happening there is we, okay. So we take, your let's say you you invest a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars or you know, actually we've got a in this case they've got a thousand dollar minimum but if you invest in the, this way um, you will take your fiat and this is uh, this is the the traditional way you'll send us a hundred dollars in in real currency and then we we create the security token you get it in your wallet so what happens is uh, you you you'll, you'll 
basically come into the site, you'll log in and you'll see, oh, I've got a thousand you know, shares and we've got them as a digital security such that you can then, you can then, it's, you know, it's not easy to, to find a, a buyer, right? You can then put them onto our secondary um, uh, marketplace which, which would be, you know, another, um, an, another demo, another time, um, and, and sell them to somebody else if, if you, you know, want out of the investment. So that's the, that's the kind of the, the traditional way, if, if you follow me. Okay, so wait, so just, just so to be clear, so uh, you, you can yeah, I have it. some Bitcoin, I want, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I mean, ideally I live anywhere, but let's just say I'm in Canada. Not yet. Make it not yet. No, 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 yeah. no, not anywhere. Okay, sorry. Uh, I live in Canada. Um, I live in Alberta or something. I want to maybe get a bit of exposure to the Ontario real yeah. residential mortgage real estate market, I guess. Yeah. Yep. And uh, which, I mean, the important thing is that it's like a real world asset uh, Correct. generating, you know, real dependable, I guess you could say, returns. And um, and then and then I technically have a, uh, a like an ownership in that or a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars, whatever it was of ownership in that security um, and but it's represented in a digital form on the Ethereum blockchain. Is that That's correct? right. Okay, That's right. Okay. So, so where it's normally you would have had something that is a uh, a PDF that says, "Here's your, you know, here's yes, your units." Yes, right yes. now, we say, "Here's you. We distribute it to you in a non-custodial way, so it goes straight into your wallet." It's Wait, hold on, your... but you still have the PDF, right? Yeah. This is yes. No, meaning, like, what if Ethereum blows up? I, no, mean, of I know it won't. But what if it does? Then yeah. what are the regulators saying about that? Right. You still have the official document because you go through our platform and there's something called a subscription agreement. You're subscribing to their shares. That's what you have. You have the official documents that say you're actually an owner. Hold on. But then I go on, let's say some secondary market sometime in the future and I sell that, but I still have the original PDF. How does that work? Yeah. No, we're going to, you know, once because we're the uh, because we're the issuer, we're the gateway here. Uh, mm, so you hold we that. Know, we know who the, we know who those are. So if you if you were to if because we match up your real world identity to your on chain identity in mm-hmm. the platform, mm-hmm. we you can't you can't really double dip. Yeah, yeah. There's there's no chance of you saying, oh, you know, I've I've got you know. I've, I've got a hundred in in some paper version and some you know hundred in some digital version. Now you can't double dip. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That was just a question here, I had, but carry on. Yeah. So, so here's where we're, this is where we're headed. Okay. Um, I'm going to maybe expand this a little bit. Um, you could, you could basically see the whole, um, the whole thing here. So what we've taken is we've taken, um, there's the, the security token themselves is, um, uh, is now digital. We've taken the, um, the security token and what we made made a um, an additional feature here essentially we we've deposited the original token into um, another smart contract which wraps it and now by wrapping it we're applying some of these what's you know we haven't talked about DeFi yet but DeFi has been one of the hotter uh, stories of 2020 right and you know there's there's some uh, there's some really good principles that are coming out of DeFi and where uh, where we're going to, how we're going to apply them looks like this. So we've taken one of, uh, let's, we've taken a Nest Capital um, real world share. And so just, just think about this digital, digitized share that uh, sits there, we wrap it and we say, now, if you have, if you have, uh, if you're an international, but I, I, just to clarify, if you're Canadian, we need you to go through our Canadian process, okay? So we're, we're what we're doing for, on an international level is, uh, is it, and this is this is hot off the press um, as as a kind of small. Uh, small scale exposure to, to the world, but let's let's um, let's look at it this way. Uh, from a uh, from someone anywhere in the world, um, and this this is now 
you know, bringing in principles of, of accessibility and inclu inclusivity and, and, the, and the regulatory side of it, you can take, you know, you know what DAI is and what USD are, uh, USDC and USDT are, of course, uh, your audience will know that, or our audience will know that um, as, as stable, as coins, stable coins, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I take, so if I, um, this, this, what it says here is that this balance is says 30. I have, let's, let's make sure that this pops up. Um, do you see my MetaMask um, uh, overlay here on the right? Uh, no, in, I just see your room. best capital still. You see my rest wrap. Oh, you don't, you don't see the, the meta mask. I see the um, logo on the top, right. But I don't see anything pulled down or anything like that. Okay. Just give me, give me a two seconds. I'll make that. Um, I will. Yeah. You might have to screen I can, share. I think I can, I think I can change that. Uh, Sunny, just give me a, a second. Um, where's the. Where's the screen sharing? I'm gonna st I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna mm -hmm. do another I'm gonna do another share here and it'll be it will be desktop. This will be um, sorry about that. Let me just take you into here. Now, are you seeing you're seeing my um, big browser again? Yep. Okay. And if I open up my MetaMask, you see the MetaMask pop down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what this says is that um, I have a MetaMask wallet, so uh, it's it's a wallet, it's a digital wallet, and it's uh, it's obviously it's accessible through uh, through the uh, through the browser, and of course, I think we're we're up to millions of users of of MetaMask, and this is this started, um, you know, the, the revolution of being able to to do financial transactions within your browser. So we offer connectivity to MetaMask. And, you know, I have an account here. I have a digital wallet that has 30 DAI in it uh, here. And uh, I can basically take and, and I could say, I'm going to take 20 DAI and I'm going to uh, swap that out or I'm going to convert it into um, a RapNest token, which is eligible for the uh, dividends. So the real world comp, uh, the real world issuer has real world um, uh, you know, dollars that they're earning, and this is this is the the bridge that we're making. Really, is uh, you know dividends from there can be uh, converted into uh, let's let's call them a USDC or or such. Right? We can have digital uh, form of dividends. And they will get uh, paid to uh, WNest. In fact, I'm showing I'm showing Dai here in our um, in our launch. So so we're we're distributing the real world dividends. We convert them with with an exchange uh, through an exchange, but we'll convert them into Dai and send them, uh, make them available to um, owners of the wrapped nest um, tokens. So essentially by taking your die here in a decentralized manner, and this is all run by smart contracts with no other intervention, um, I can, I'll, I'll do a, a swap transaction here and it'll tell me that I'll have 26.64 um, uh, tokens. And I will authorize, I'll authorize the transaction and I'll just go ahead and, and, and do this here. So at this point, I've got 13.32 WNest. And so far, it's earned. And we've, we've uh, created another um, mechanism here to actually um, accrue dividends. So, you know, until you withdraw the dividends, we will tell you how much you've accrued of these dividends of, of DAI. So um, this particular wallet has a certain number of um, of WNest uh, tokens and uh, is is uh, eligible to receive now 0 0.0044 die and it just you know it changes pretty much block by block so now if i were to take these uh, tokens and uh, and basically uh, give them to somebody else that uh, they will now start to earn the die now what 
practically speaking means that someone in uh, you know another um, you know another jurisdiction, someone internationally that has DAI can now become a participant and earn yield from a Canadian mortgage-backed asset, and that's. That's the way that we're going to bridge real world assets to the, the new world of, um, of decentralized finance. I mean, this is, this is just step number one. Um, but I mean, from, a, uh, from where, we, where we began, and you'll notice that uh, we now have, oh, I, have, uh, I don't have enough to do another transaction there. However, uh, we've now recorded the fact that um, this, is, this account now owns 39.96 worth of these wrapped tokens, which are eligible for dividends. And now I'm starting to earn dividends on the new balance. And you know, from a, from a, you know, Look, look broadly now to, I can be in another country and I can, I, let's, let's, let's just say I am in India and I have some dye uh, and now I can become a, an investor in a real world asset and get real world yields. And you know, when, it's, when it's high enough, I, I can withdraw those dividends into my, uh, into my wallet. Mm. Interesting. So that's kind of the end vision, if you will, right? Yeah. Like where somebody, and we're not there yet with what you're showing us here, but you're saying, I guess maybe in our next demo or next uh, podcast, we can, we can cover a bit of that, that final. This, phase, right? this is live. You mm -hmm. can go today to international.tokenfunction.com. Oh, oh, anybody can go here. Interesting. Okay. You can, you can go to international.tokenfunder.com. It is live. And hmm. You know, we are making enhancements uh, to this. You'll you'll see some uh, you'll see some new enhancements um, um, as you know as the weeks uh, come by. But right now, you can do this so, now so, so, if, if yeah, you're a Canadian. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're a Canadian, we we need you to go through the you know if, the or if, if you're a U.S. or Canadian, we need you to go through the uh, through this approach. Um, but we're making this available, and we're looking for. At this point, of course, we're we're making it um, uh, we're making it available to everyone. But we're also looking for feedback on how um, how user friendly it is, how you know where uh, you know how you how you want this to evolve. And so this is like step number one. This is not um, what I talked about um, as our secondary market, where you can kind of trade. Um, too. That's going to be that's still on the Canadian site. This is brand new DeFi functionality that we're um you know beta testing essentially but it's live on the main net it works interesting so, so that's why we've, we've limited we've limited risk by the way you'll notice that right now in this pool we we only have um a small pool because because of course you know we don't want uh, you don't want somebody to come in and and uh, you know throw a million dollars into this um, today it's it's uh, for testing first... purposes right well, well, it's but, but just it's to sum rich. up though like the kind of the idea of what's happening here because there's a lot right um but but essentially at the end of the day so most people are getting out of real world assets and getting into bitcoin right that's kind of the trend but what you're saying or what you're doing is you're saying okay well we could use similar technology, right? Because Ethereum and Bitcoin are similar in that sense to enable essentially the opposite, right? Where somebody's, let's say that all they have is Bitcoin and they're like, it'd be nice to have, you know, maybe they're super heavy, heavily weighted on that. And they, and they think, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have access to returns that are being yielded off of a real world physical asset? And, exactly. and by the way, Toronto real estate's pretty... It's a pretty, uh, oh, at least traditionally for the last many years has been has been a great place to invest. But you know, I can see. I mean, there's a lot of Bitcoiners that that believe in in land, for example, or you know, uh, they believe in things like that. So so if there's a desire for one to kind of again, and there's somewhere else not in Canada, they now have this ability to potentially put a bit of money into a mortgage real estate company that's based in Ontario um, using this, your platform, right? This, this is where we've now brought, that's, that's exactly right, Sonny. That's exactly right. And Think and about this though, one because- application, the, right? It could, this, it could, it could this, be other, yeah, yeah, go ahead. The, 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 the real world assets 
that are going to be made available like this are are going to blow this the the, the DeFi space. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to 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 use a non uh, you know no non uh, kind of standard term, but it's going to blow up. And you know, it this this space these bringing real world assets into uh, into the blockchain and bringing them in uh, in a safe manner like this that is that is um, you know secured with um, uh, with smart contracts that that are uncensorable and you know, it, it, if, if, you know I, this is like a thousand I, times the market size of what is available today in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, maybe way more, right? Oh, like it's, a it's thousand? E like, easily. So probably we're, way more. Like we're, you're talking we're talk about everything else. We're talking about <laughs> hundreds of trillions of dollars. The physical world. You're talking about bringing kind of the physical world of securities essentially into the blockchain, which is not a small feat, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely um, an admirable one. There's... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was going to say, have you ever looked at, and I had Diego speak at one of my events, but have you ever looked at Rootstock? And I'm just curious, like, is there a reason, like, if you're going to be bringing, like you just said, trillions and trillions, I mean, potentially trillions of, like, assets onto the blockchain, don't you necessarily, I mean, especially coming from, like, the banking and the kind of the technical security world, wouldn't you be leaning more towards like a very, very secure kind of robust platform that doesn't get forked and all that? Uh, I'm just curious, like as an entrepreneur, have you ever had any sort of uh, experiences where, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like even in our lifetime, we've seen Ethereum make changes and et cetera, et cetera. Has, have the regulators well, ever been concerned on that front or, or do you sure, feel pretty? Sure. Yeah. Here's, here's the, I mean, here's the, the, now here's the real uh, you know, benefit of what we have right now is because, you know, in a sense, the, uh, you know, we're regulated, right? So, so we had to have thought about all of this already. And, you know, as a regulated entity, we can't, uh, we, we, of course, are, are concerned about, you know, the technology and, and such. We have the ability, if, if we needed to, and when we need to, is to, um, uh, you know, move if if there were to be you know an upgrade to the to the blockchain, um, we'll be able to handle it. Um, so so yes, we've looked at others. I mean, we've been we've obviously we've we've grown up with the if with the Ethereum uh, kind of ecosystem and the blockchain. Um, yeah, we we looked at others and we continue to look at others. So uh, that's all, that's Got something we, we that's something we always do. I mean, at this point. Uh, you know, as, as I said, uh, there, there's so many developers and, and the space is moving so quickly in the Ethereum blockchain that it still makes sense for, for us to continue because of the, the, the real kind of, uh, you know, center of gravity and, and the, the, the momentum that's around you specifically. You don't see my screen anymore if, yeah. if I'm right, right? No, I don't see your screen anymore. Yeah, Alan, I was going to say, we've already done like quite a bit. I know um, you had a bit of a hard stop yep. coming up, but, um, I, and I'm also, like I said, I, I love the idea of doing a follow-up maybe next week or two weeks from now, whenever you're ready, we can dive maybe deeper into, you know, some of these newer platforms you're building and whatnot. But just, I guess, you know, there were a bunch of other questions as well that I normally ask that we never really got an answer. Uh, well, no, I was going to say is, is that we could either go to them now um, or we could, you know, save those questions for our, for the one next week as well, because we did cover almost like an hour and wow. 45 minutes. Nice. Um, but, but like I said, I'm, I'm down to bag those questions and, and keep them for the next one. But before we kind of like, you know, departed here, I wanted to give you a chance to sum up any kind of key points and also share the website specifically and Twitter handles and just kind of where people can, you know, learn more until, until we have our next yeah, talk here. Yeah. Well, uh, sure. I, I, you know, I really enjoyed this as, as, a uh, as our kind of catch up and uh, video for, uh, for the community to share. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been a number of, um, you know, interesting conversations we've had and I appreciate, uh, you know, there's, there's so much more we can talk about. I think in summary, uh, you know, we've we have seen the regulatory you know, environment um, kind of evolve. I think as as rapidly as they could have in, in the last few years, and we've been 
Uh, we've been extremely close to it, as, as you've heard uh, in the Canadian space. And uh, we've, we've appreciated um, the fact that they, they realized that they had to do a lot of catching up and they did. So, uh, so we continue to, uh, you know, we continue to kind of come out with um, where the, we believe where the next, you know, the, the next, you know, evolution of this is going is into secondary training. And, you know, we'll do that on us on another podcast or on another video cast. Um, and, and now we need to all be looking at uh, what I'd say are the, the, the kind of key principles of of what decentralized finance is teaching us, that, that we can do this, uh, you know, we can do this safely. We can start to bring real world assets to, uh, to, the, to being on-chain assets and to do that safely uh, so that, you know, we, we expand, um, you know, the, the asset classes that are coming on. I think there's uh, in, 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 you know, every day, you know, looking around what's happening, we see a lot of, you know, DeFi activity and, and it, uh, it did get a lot of attention in the summer. I think it, it's very, you know, it's limited to, to what cryptocurrencies uh, can do today. Uh, and we, we certainly see our part of the, you know, equation being bringing these real world assets and helping the, the ecosystem just, you know, go from, you know, zero to a hundred in, uh, in, in, you know, in a number of short years. Um, and, and I think it all, it, it will all come together at the same time as we have a, you know, a global uh, kind of alignment, kind of another, you call it another Bretton Woods or whatever it will be called. We'll have, we'll have uh, central banks that will have official uh, central bank digital currencies. So, so we may not use, we may not use DAI and we may or may not use DAI. We may add USD, the official, we may add the, you know, the Canadian official, uh, you know, uh, you know, payment uh, currency. And of course we will. Um, and it'll be just as efficient. I think if we, if we solve, if we solve problems of accessibility and, and, if, and make it so much more efficient with a great user experience, I think we'll be able to bring a lot more, uh, you know, investors into, uh, a, into these assets, you know, in a safe and regulated way, and and I, you know, I, I strongly believe that um, we can also uh, continue to change the game and work with the regulators to to give more access to 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 get uh, to get uh, kind of greater uh, change uh, from from where we historically were, because I think we can prove to them that we don't need to build you know massive infrastructures and that we can take uh, we can take advantage of these. Uh, uh, new secure uh, blockchain technologies that are available to us and, uh, and really digitize um, our capital markets. So, you know, that's, that's our, that's our focus. And if, uh, you know, to kind of sum it all up, we're, we're experiencing a, a lot of change. It all started with Bitcoin. And by the way, I'll say a couple of days ago, I think you, we all know this was the 12th year anniversary of the original white paper, right? So yes, sir. 12 years, not a long oh, time. Freaking years. Uh, and 12 years just went by like, like nothing. Mm. But it was at obviously around the same time as our last global financial crisis. So, you know, we're going to, we're coming up to some uh, really interesting times and we're in them right now with the, uh, uh, with a, you know, a massive structural changes in, in the financial infrastructure. And, and this will be part of the change, I believe. Yeah. So with that, um, yeah, maybe we'll uh, we'll leave the other questions for for another podcast. Uh, yeah, really yeah. Let's save them. Let's save them. Really I appreciate we this. Uh, sharing this with you. I mean, I think there's so much more that we can we can talk about, and uh, you know, it, it's it doesn't all have to be regulatory um, driven. But of course, that's the world we live in today, and we we yeah. want to make this available to to the average person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely a. I consider myself a Bitcoin maximalist. Yeah. Um, but if there's one area within the Ethereum space that really interests me, it's this security token offering. And 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 I used to be uh, securities. I used to have a mutual fund license and all that. So I have a bit of insight into that. And I always felt like uh, that there's a 
I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, you know, a bit of a question mark in terms of like, um, you know, it still hasn't gone mainstream per se, right? Like the way ICOs and, and it has, but, but my gut says that, you know, we'll eventually land um, squarely in, in that space somewhere and it will be ginormous. So you're one of the, definitely the, the kind of the pioneers in this space, really excited about the stuff you're doing. And uh, yeah, Alan, like I said, you know, if you want to even do a, maybe like a monthly or something sync where we maybe analyze not just what you're working on, but the, the security token market space and, and take a bit of a magnifying glass to the projects and talk about what they're doing good, what there may be, where there could be doing better i think people are are i mean well i don't know if people are but i know i'm hungry to learn more about that <laughs> so i'd always be down to down to do a little jam and you know we can have a bit of continuity here well we we covered a lot of ground and uh, you're, you're one of the few that uh, i shared more of the back story with uh, so yeah thanks cool thanks for making this opportunity available of course anyone can hit me up at uh, alan at tokenfunder.com we've got our We've got our Twitter handles and and yeah, check it out at uh, international.tokenfunder.com, especially if you're someone that's in the, uh, if really in the uh, Ethereum space today, all you need is that MetaMask wallet and uh, some stable coins and, uh, and we'd love to talk to you and make sure that it's working for you. This is very cool. So I'll, I'll share this with uh, with my network, uh, you know, in the coming days. And uh, yeah, I just started doing these, you know, these YouTube videos like about a week ago. I was just checking this morning, 11,000 minutes, watch time minutes in the last week, Alan. So congrats. So congrats. It's, I mean, it's, it's early days. There. I'm no tone vase, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, I'm actually going on tones the to show tomorrow. So, uh, Fantastic. But, uh, but yeah, but thanks for your time, Alan. And like I said, let's do this again when you guys are ready to do the next uh, show and tell. <laughs> There's lots more coming. Okay. All right. Okay. Take care. I'm going to pause this here.